you're up against natural forces now and you need to pay attention to the, the standard operating procedures or the a few standard orders, the 10 standard orders that, that give you a good, good basis on which to keep yourself safe in that environment. There's not very many times when it's worth people getting hurt in, in a situation to, to save a little bit of forest. And, uh, and so we really need to be aware of, of our assignments and, and, and just, I think, evaluate once we get them to say, okay, is this, is this worth it, basically? You know, the, there's things that can happen on a quarter acre fire that you know, if someone does get hurt, a snag could fall on them or something. And it's a real danger that people get too complacent and, and not worry about establishing communication. I don't think it's possible to safely fight a fire without having lookouts, communication, escape routes, and safety zones. Maybe, maybe if it was a smaller fire, you wouldn't really need a lookout. I think every situation is a little bit different, but for the most part, I think that um, they all four need to be at least a part of your decision-making process when you're in a fire. I think often on a fire the the helicopter pilot is not really viewed as a firefighter and I think that I think that if that pilot is viewed as a firefighter it's going to be that much more cohesive as far as working as a team and, and being able to to have the same objectives and I like to think of myself as a firefighter. I have a different tool. I have the helicopter instead of a Pulaski or a chainsaw. But first and foremost, I'm going to fly the aircraft, but I'm using the aircraft to fight fire, and I do consider myself a firefighter. I think if, if more of our uh, people on the ground would, would understand that, I think that the helicopter could be used even more effectively in the future. There was a, a tragedy in Southern California where an engine crew had gotten it was on its fire, the fire blew up, and everybody escaped to safety, but some of the personnel went to a different area than was everybody supposed they were supposed to. The supervisor, of course, went back to check for that person and then was, became a fatality. And that's where my biggest concern with the shock crew is that, you know, as that safety zone moves, did everybody get the message clearly and cleanly so that when we get there, we're all there? Because, you know, sometimes we are scattered about. I guess when, when I first started fighting fires, there was a lot of things I didn't, um, I didn't understand. There's a lot of lingo flying around in fire that only firefighters know, and um, that made it really hard, kind of, at first, was, you know, I'd hear all these terms and things that I'm supposed to go do, and a lot of times I didn't even know what that meant. But, you know, I felt kind of stupid to ask. So I guess along the same lines of what I... You know, if I was going to tell a new person, kind of along the same lines, don't feel dumb ever to ask questions um, and figure out what's going on. Because I don't like to not know what's going on um, as far as, you know, just to feel comfortable. I like to be in the loop a bit, know, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I, that was actually one thing that when I started fighting fires, I wish someone would have sat me down a little bit and kind of explained the whole how things work. Contingency plans on it, like, et cetera, like flashy fuels and stuff, when you're looking at safety hazards and stuff, or looking at anything, even before you start a plan, you always have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. Um, you know, <clears throat> you go in with just a plan A, and that plan blows up, and you put in, you know, you've got X amount of crew members underneath you that are going to be put into a, to a hairy situation. So um, when I go into strategy, I always look at, you know, two to three different plans that are going to work, or, or, or if plan A doesn't work, you know, you can't go in there with the, the attitude that this is a plan and it's going to work. Um, I always go in there with plan A, plan B, and plan C, because it comes back to, you know, you watch out situations. If the weather changes, you get a wind or you're in different fuels than you thought you'd be, you know, the fuels were drier than you thought they'd be. Then you've got a plan B. You know, you back up and you look at it and you say, well, let's bump down to the next road or let's do something different that's not going to put this crew into a situation. Hi, I'm Larry Sutton, BLM Training Unit Leader at the Fire Center in Boise. We've put this program together to provide you with another tool for refresher training. 
Uh, there's some things out there that people have seen a lot of times and we wanted to put something new out there and our concept was to have it be like a conversation among all of us, kind of like you'd have on a fire where you're talking to people, sorting through things, figuring out what's going on and maybe have that conversation a little bit earlier in the year. We all know that physical fitness is really important in firefighting and I guess we need to consider that mental fitness is just as important and that this is one way to get your head back in the game is to go through this type of program and think through what's going to happen when you're out there this, this summer, how you're going to do things safely and operate in the kinds of environments that we get into. Uh, a lot of times you'll hear people tell you to be safe out there, but what does that really mean? What are they really, what are they really getting at when, when they say that? And maybe they don't know, but we need to as firefighters. So I think you'll get a lot more out of this program if you participate in it. We can all learn from each other. You can learn from your peers, both that are in this program and that are sitting around the table with you. So I hope you enjoy the program and have a safe season and make lots of money. The Bureau of Land Management Fire Training Program presents Fireline Safety Refresher Training. And now, the host of your program, Ted Mason. Hello, and welcome to BLM's Fireline Safety Refresher Training. In this training session, we're going to explore many of the aspects of safety on the fire line. We're going to help you brush up on your basic safety awareness and take a look at some real life examples of lessons learned out on the ground. Throughout this course, you'll be working with your local facilitator to complete the exercises that we've kind of cooked up for you here and to facilitate some discussions on fireline safety. Your participation is key to making this training successful, so please don't just sit there. But before we go any further, I'd like to introduce our panel of safety experts who will be joining me as we look at some safety in fire operations. From Las Vegas, Nevada, we have Nicole Hallisey. She's an experienced engine captain who has some unique perspectives to share with us on fire safety. Welcome, Nicole. Thanks, Ted. I'm excited to be here working with you, the panel members, and everyone out there. I hope I can indeed offer some unique perspectives on fire line safety and hopefully some insight into engine operations. Good. And from Boise, Idaho, to discuss hell attack operations, and what we'll need to keep in mind as we head out into this coming fire season is Brad Bolin. Brad, thanks for being here. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, discussing fire line safety with everyone. And also from Boise, to provide the smoke jumper point of view, is uh, Hector Madrid. I believe you have a recent story you're going to uh, share with us in, involving the use of LCES. Uh, how you doing, Hector? Glad to be here, Ted. Uh, hopefully today I can offer you a different twist on fire line safety from the smoke jumper's perspective. And yes, we'll be discussing LCES a little bit more later on. Good. And completing our panel from Jackson, Mississippi, to provide us with some real on-the-ground perspectives is a good friend of mine. Lamar Lydell, who is the superintendent of the Jackson Hot Shots. Hello, Ted. I'm excited to be here and offer a perspective from a hot shot point of view. Good. Looking forward to it. Uh, in order for you to complete this refresher training, you'll need to have a copy of your course workbook, which your facilitator should have passed out to you. Your workbook contains uh, our training objectives, information on the topics we'll be covering, and some training exercises, and then at the end also an evaluation. To help you follow along, We'll be referring to pages in your workbook as we discuss the many aspects of fireline safety. Uh, and in your workbook on page three, you can also find some biographical information on our panelists and some of the key speakers you'll see in our videos. One final word before we get started. This is called refresher training for a reason. Although you have probably heard a lot of uh, this information many times before, humans have a tendency to store or file away information that they don't use on a regular basis. The purpose of this training is to pull this information back out of that filing cabinet in your brain and make it readily available for you to use during the approaching fire season. The panelists and myself will do our best to help you retrieve this information, but we realize that the best resource for this task is probably yourself and perhaps the people sitting right next to you right now. No two fires are exactly the same. Everybody has their own unique set of experiences and knowledge. I urge you to share your knowledge and experience while you participate in these exercises and discussions that will follow. I challenge you to leave this training session with at least one new awareness or mental trigger 
that you can take with you to the fire line that's going to assist you in keeping fire line safety foremost in your mind. Whether you get this from the panelist or from the person sitting right next to you is really not that important. What is important is that during this training you actively seek out new information that will make you, it will help you make sound, safe decisions on the fire line. Now the first thing we're going to review is the 10 standard fire orders. They are listed in your workbook on page 8. Uh, everyone knows that these are also in your fire line handbook and in this incident pocket guide that we all carry on the fire line, I'm, I'm sure. But remember that using and understanding them is what's really important, not just memorizing them. This past winter, I had the privilege of sitting down with a man named John Krebs. Uh, you can read all about John in your workbook. He started his career in 1958. Uh, he spent many years as a FMO or a fire management officer on the St. Joe National Forest, and he was a fire beha uh, behavior analyst for 21 years. John kept me extremely entertained when we were talking about his outdoor adventures in Idaho, his apple orchards, and a black bear hunting story that uh, I'll never forget. But when the subject turned to firefighting, things got real serious. Although recently retired, John still has a real passion for the 10 standard orders, and he was around when they were first initiated into fire service. In your workbook on page 5, you'll find a reference to a letter that John wrote. In it, he talks about the original sequence of the standard orders and why they were written in that order. In the tape you're about to see, John will share with us the original grouping of these orders. The first three orders pertain to fire behavior. The second three orders pertain to safety, and the third pertain to organizational control. The last order, which is now of course listed as number one, is fight fire aggressively but provide for safety first. Talking with John gave me a new perspective on utilizing the 10 standard orders as a useful tool during fire operations. Let's take a look. Now, the 10 standard orders, the original 10 standard orders, were developed as a result of the Man Gulch fire in 1949. And uh, I think the chief of the Forest Service was responsible for assembling a team they came together. These were people that had their feet in the fire that were the old fire horses, uh, Shovel and Pulaski people. And uh, they came together and they tried to develop some orders that would help the firefighter, whether it be a large fire or a small fire. And so they, uh, they began with what they thought was most important when considering fire suppression, and that was fire behavior. And we, all, we always know that uh, one of the thing, most influential things on fire behavior is the weather. So the first, uh, the orders were grouped, fire behavior, safety, and, and then organizational control. Well, they started out with the fire weather. And the first one they said was keep informed on fire weather conditions and forecasts. Now, there's two parts to that. The first deals with the conditions. You is imperative in all of these orders, meaning you, the firefighter, the lowest grunt on the ground. Keep informed on fire weather conditions. Now the forecaster doesn't give you the conditions. He gives you the forecast. The meteorologist gives you the forecast. The conditions are your responsibility. For instance, you might have a a forecaster that says you're going to have strong southwesterly winds and you're on the lee side of a ridge and you know those winds curl around over that ridge top strong winds and you get a wind out of the northwest or northeast that's your responsibility you've got to measure the condition you look up and see a cumulus cloud or cumulus castellatus clouds you know there's instability aloft that's observations that you make on the job. So you keep informed on conditions and then don't forget to ask about the forecast. Nobody has the responsibility to give you a forecast. You have a responsibility to ask for a forecast. And I want to just emphasize that time and again. If you review fires, you'll find that this is one of the things that's often overlooked. Failure to obtain a forecast, failure to keep in mind the weather conditions with belt weather kits and observations. The second of those fire orders that deal with fire behavior has to deal with knowing what your fire is doing at all times. You observe personally, 
you use scouts, lookouts, whatever, to try to keep a handle on how your fire is behaving. And then you ask, keep, base all actions on current and expected behavior of the fire. So you've analyzed this from the weather, you've analyzed it from the topography and time of day and all this, to base those actions on what you see currently and what you anticipate will happen. And that also brings in fire history, because what did the fire do last night, for instance, is very important when evaluating what the fire is going to do in the heat of the day when the humidities are much lower and uh, the weather completely changes. Well, then it goes from that, Ted, into the, uh, the orders that deal with safety. And we know orders that talk about, uh, you know, maintaining a lookout when there's possible danger. It says, post a lookout when there's possible danger. You post a lookout when there's possible danger, not somebody else. Of course, you might not be the person in charge, but you say, hey, a little problem that this snag over here is burning and uh, I've got to dig fire line. I think I need a lookout. Okay. If there's a limb going to fall out of a tree or if you've fa been falling trees that have fire in them, you know you got somebody there to tap on your shoulder with a branch if there's an ember coming down from above. It's going to give you some problems. So that's posting a lookout when there's possible danger. Have escape routes for everyone and make them known. The supervisor is usually the person that has escape routes. Making them known is his responsibility. Knowing them is your responsibility. You ask that person, hey, where's the escape route? Do we need it? Well, you might not need an escape route if you've evaluated that fire behavior and the conditions are such that the fire is not the threat. So you might not need that. The next one has to de deal with uh, keeping alert, you know, be alert, keep calm, think clearly, act decisively. Really, that, that's hard to do. After a 24-hour shift and you're out there and you know one of the 18 situations that shot watch out is you feel like taking a nap near a fire, well, how do you be alert, keep calm, think clearly, and act decisively when, when the sun is just beginning to shine in on you after spending all night on the fire and you think, oh man, I've got to have a little nap here. Well. You do this because you've analyzed this fire behavior. And, and so you've got an analytical way of looking at things. And that helps you to put that down in writing, to stay alert when you really, your body is saying, hey man, I can't do this anymore. So there, those three deal with safety. And I know you can elaborate on those from your experiences. And then we get into organizational control. And organizational control means maintaining control of your forces at all times. Now, how do you do that? Well, Pulaski, in the 1910 fire, did it with a revolver. And he kept 40-some people in a cave for the fire. Well, you don't need a revolver if you've analyzed these fire behavior orders, because that helps to maintain control of your people. They feel free to ask questions of the supervisor to collectively look at what the fire is going to do. So maintaining control becomes a thing that's a whole lot easier. Then, then you talk about maintaining prompt communications with your men, your boss, and adjoining forces. Something that has to be done in order to, to know what's going on. One way to know what's going on. But it's a two-way street when we talk about, about maintaining prompt communications or giving clear instructions and being sure they're understood. Uh, that's two ways. Uh, I give clear instructions, you give clear instructions, the receiver doesn't understand a thing. They need to ask. I need to ask if the instruction is not clear. Again, analysis, looking at, at the situation you're in, uh, when you take a break, that's important. That and the instructions will become clearer when you do that. I think the grouping is really summarized when you talk about the first of the fire orders as compared to the last of the standard orders, the 10 standards. The first of the fire orders said, fight fire aggressively, but provide for safety first. Now you can't fight fire aggressively until you've analyzed the fire behavior. 
until you've looked at it and said, hey, I'm not going to be bitten by, by this kind of, of action. You know, you can't know what kind of, of escape routes, lookouts, what have you, until you've evaluated what the fire behavior is going to be. So those things follow sequentially. And then when you get to the last order again, fight fire aggressively, having gone through this methodical method of evaluation. Um, I thought his article was really, uh, I related to it well. And uh, the way he divided it up, the, the process that he goes through hits home a lot more for me. And uh, the best part of it is the is the last part where he says fight fire aggressively but providing for safety first I like that the best it uh, keys something in my mind rather than um, but provide for safety first um, I definitely like providing for safety first I think that they're being utilized people don't consciously think about it be because it becomes ingrained it becomes intuitive and in the back of their mind, I think they're thinking about it. Uh, it's, it's in the decision-making process, and you go through that analysis type thing, then, then it's being considered. But, but in terms of, of just consciously clicking through 1 through 10 or trying to use the mnemonic, uh, I don't think that happens. But I think all decisions or the majority of the decisions that are made, uh, they are the foundation. They are the fundamentals. And I think they're being considered. Well, we've, we've always had a, a, a standard to abide by, a, a guideline to remember to, to, to protect ourselves, to help each other. Um, um, all pretty much rolled into a, a, a heads up situation. Uh, these are things to look out for and, and so on and so forth. And um, More so than anything with, with myself, it, it's a matter of common sense. now. Did I have that common sense when I was 18? No. Uh, but through a period of time and, and a certain amount of fires, I suppose, you, you come to grips with the, the, the necessity and the importance of the guidelines and, and of the, uh, the firefighting orders. Um, it just comes about as a stark reality that <clears throat> all of this is, is extremely important. and. Um, and a number of them will probably be tested every fire. In, in reference to the fire, 10 standard fire orders, I believe that they are utilized on a daily basis uh, on fires as a way to make decisions, no-go, go, no-go no decisions. I also believe that they are the standard. I believe in those standards because I came from an organization that people lost their lives, and that's where these came from. The El Carrizo Hot Shots and the Cleveland Hot Shots both had incidents that the 10 and 18 came directly out of. So I'm a firm believer in them. I know I use them both to, to evaluate a situation and also to brief people that I may be supervising on the fire line and as a reference point to make sure that I have covered my bases um, and that I'm running a safe operation. Uh, when I'm out in a far edge, far line, and for using the tins, it's a, uh, oh, just, I don't want to say instinct, but you just I use all my senses throughout the uh, operation period of what's going on, how it's going, they, they play off of each other. When you're out there, it's, um, something can happen, you don't know why your decision came up, but it's, it'd be one of the tens. Something will have changed your mind without even thinking about it directly or reading it. It just comes up, when you're out there for a while, you just, you just learn. And I mean, the schooling helps, don't get me wrong, learning stuff, but when you're out there after a while, you get common sense, and that helps too and they can't teach that. Those are some excellent comments. It certainly makes sense to me uh, to group the standard orders in the manner that John Krebs explains. But no matter how you remember them, the important thing is that you understand them and that you use them when you're on the fire line making decisions. 
Next, we're going to go ahead and discuss the 18 watch-out situations. Let's talk for a second about the difference between the 10 standard orders and the 18 watch-out situations. I'd like to ask our panel members for their thoughts on this one. Nicole, what do you think is the actual difference between the 10 standard orders and the 18 situations of shout watch out? You know, Ted, um, a lot of times people refer to it as the 10 and 18 like they're one entity, but in actuality they are different concepts with different applications. The 10 standard orders are just that. They're orders. They can't be bent or broken, and they must be adhered to at all times. The 18 situations that shout watch out are something that you should be looking for on the fire line while you're out there. Um, they can be compromised if actions are taken to mitigate the risks at the time. But one thing you do have to realize is the more 18 situations that you compromise, you run the greater risk of actually compromising or breaking one of your 10 standard orders. So. That's true. Good comment. Anybody else? Lamar, you got anything? Brad? You know, Ted, uh, it doesn't really matter to me how you remember the fire orders or the watch out situations, as long as you do understand them and apply them correctly. Lamar? Yeah, and I, I agree with Brad also, but you know, I sat here listening to the, to the discussion and feeling the views and it takes me all the way back to what John Chris was saying about the, uh, the order and, and, and the way they're grouped. And that's, that's real important to me, not to say that one's more important than the other. Uh, the thought process is really important and, and it's, it's easier for some people to remember them the way they're revised. But also, I think the big difference, one of the differences in, in, in the 10 and 18 is that the, the standard orders are, are a guideline for developing our day-to-day -day operational plans. Those uh, 18 watch out situations along with LCES, uh, look up, look down, look around, all are merely tools to help us reinforce those 10 and 18. And that takes us right back to what John Kreft is saying. And one order that stands out to me more than anything is uh, Fire Order Number Six. And it speaks of uh, uh, stay alert, stay calm, think clearly, act decisively. And I think that's something that we'll look at throughout the uh, rest of this uh, field of these, what we got going on today. Good comment. And I agree with you on that. If, if I like running through the 10 orders as a process, the way that John explains it. And by doing that, uh, that number six, stay alert, stay calm. Uh, by being alert, that's where you're really seeking out and looking for different watch out situations that might be present. Think clearly, act decisively, that's where you're mitigating those 18 situations. So to me, the 18 kind of play right into that process of, of running through the 10 standard orders. But, you know, the, the important thing is everybody has a different way of remembering them. The important thing is, is that you do understand them and you do use them when you're making fire line decisions. Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at what some other field personnel that, that we've interviewed this last winter have to say about watch out situations? The 10 standard orders are rules that are there for us, for us not to break, not to widen the gaps and, and adjust them to the way that they fit our needs. They're there for a reason. People have lost their lives to teach us those. And it's our responsibility to honor those folks by learning these and not making the same mistake that they did. The 18 are there to help us be aware that we're getting close to breaking maybe a t one of the 10 standard orders. We definitely can fight fire, you know, while breaking 10, or not 10, but say three watch outs. That's fine as long as you're thinking about them because we do it as hot shots constantly. It's just the name of the game and the job we do. But they're there just to, to keep our mindset to, hey, we're getting close to the line now, and maybe it's time to open up our eyes a little bit more and, and really take a little bit better look at the situational awareness that we have right now. I think the, the 10 standard orders are guidelines that keep you safe while you're on the fire line. And I've always kind of looked at the 18 standard watchouts as <laughs> like reality. I mean, it, it's the nature of fire behavior. I mean, wildfires you're always going to have something that happens. I mean, you're always going to, you know, have be, not always, but you're going to be working, working a line downhill, or you're going to have stuff rolling out, or it's going to get hotter and drier, or the winds are going to pick up, whatever. You know, that stuff just happens. That's just the nature of fire. It, seem, it seems that there's a, 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 a connected series of watchouts that, to me, are the most uh, often it's not that they're misunderstood, that they're probably the most often unmitigated. 
and safety zones and escape routes not identified, not timed, not flagged correctly, not communicated, not updated. And then also instructions and assignments not clear. That's the connection there. If we're given vague assignments and instructions, the escape routes and safety zones are kind of also vague. We're not really sure where we're supposed to be going, therefore we're not sure where we shouldn't go. And then also, uh, we're uninformed on strategy, tactics, and hazards. This seems to be the little triangle of miscommunication here that most often leads to, to crews getting in trouble. And by trouble, I mean they get in too far. Uh, they don't have time to react. They don't have time to mitigate the hazards. And um, then they're reacting to the situation rather than proactively saying, since we know we're supposed to go here and do this, we know our escape route to our safety zone is here and we're all comfortable and, and we're proactive. We're able to, to be aggressive to suppress the fire because we have provided for safety. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that I see, um, especially in that transition between, say, a Type 3 incident and a Type 2 incident, are kind of administrative watchouts. And uh, they have to do with the complexity of an organization kind of outracing, um, outracing people's knowledge of the situation, maybe. So uh, you have a Type two team maybe replacing a type three team. Uh, you have a whole bunch of resources coming in, yet the new management team isn't yet up to snuff on the, what the fire is actually doing. Uh, it can be the same thing transitioning from initial attack to a type three incident. You know, you have a type three structure coming in to take over, yet they don't really know quite what's going on yet, yet they've got all this stuff coming in and they're under, you know, under the gun to really get stuff rolling and to get this fire put out. So I see that there should be some kind of, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest adding it to the list, but I think I do see it a lot when we transition from IA to type 3 or type 2 that there's this administrative watch out that always occurs to me. It's like, watch out. Somebody else has taken over this fire and they don't really know what's going on yet. There hasn't been a good briefing. Uh, you know, some of the stuff is covered in the other watch outs, but uh, to me it's the, uh, it's the management team is coming watch out. And I know everybody's seen it. You see it when it goes from type 2 to type 1. And every time you transition, it, it occurs. But uh, that one I see all the time. Those were some great comments we just heard. And if you're like me, you have a lot of comments uh, to piggyback on top of what we just heard from those people with their feet in the fire, as John would say. But I'm going to open it up to the panel right now. Uh, does anybody have any comments on what we just heard on the 18? Hector? Yeah, I, I sure do, Ted. Um, one of the people interviewed said, uh, can you break a watch-out situation? And, I, and his point's well taken. Um, yes, I feel in a roundabout way, and not jeopardize what I'm trying to say here, but yeah, and there are certain cir circumstances where a watch out probably can be broken. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, you're stationed in the middle of Nevada, flat rolling terrain, cheat grass environment, what have you. Middle of the night, your crew gets a call that uh, there's a fire uh, burning somewhere out in the desert in flat rolling country. And uh, your assignment when you get there is you tie in with the incident commander. He says uh, he wants you and your crew uh, to punch a line along the certain section of the line. Well, you can go down the watch out list, and now you're going to find something there that says, uh, fire not seen, seen or scouted in daylight. Um, you know, in this particular circumstance, uh, the situation may not be that bad, and you can proceed with uh, uh, your assignment. On the contrary, uh, say you received an assignment and you were somewhere in the middle of Idaho, and a call came into the Payette, and now you're on the Salmon River breaks, and you know you've got rolling rocks and timber and such. You can see where that watch out would now apply. So I think a lot of it is uh, going back to common sense and uh, using it as a guide uh, to kind of mitigate a, ho a whole lot of measures like that. I agree with you. It gets back to what John Krebs was talking about as far as it's your responsibility. I love how he said that it, there's a, a you that's imperative there, uh, that it's your responsibility to control and monitor conditions. And conditions change depending on where you're at, what time of day. In fact, they're constantly changing whenever you're on a fire operation. Let Anybody else? Well, let me ask the panel this. When do you know you've broken uh, a number of these watch out situations, when do you know is the trigger to say, hey, I need to step back? Anybody? It's a good question. I don't know. I think a lot of it, like you were saying, is common sense. Uh, you you, you kind of know when you, you when you kind of cross that line and say, well, I, you know, I think uh, me and you were talking one, one time, you were talking about Paul Gleason and going through those doors. Mm -hmm. You can't bag up. Well, sometimes you make those decisions and you can't bag up. You, know, you have to keep going with it, but if you can, you, you need to. You need to say, man, I'm, I'm, we're going to hold up here. This is it. Mm -hmm. All right, we've broken too many rules. We're, 
We've, I've seen too many watch out situations and, and, and we're going to step back and let this go. And I think uh, most management teams will, uh, understand where you're coming from and, and, and decide to go along with what you're saying. Okay, we won't do this. We'll wait till tomorrow. Paul Gleason, you were talking about that. Uh, those are decision gates he was talking about. Exactly. And once you walk through a decision gate, and it happens all the time on a fire line, that there's certain spots where you make a decision to go or no go, and at that point, since you walk through that gate, those gates sometimes lock behind you, and you can't turn around and reverse that decision. Uh, the watch out situations are in place so that it, they are to remind you that these conditions are present, and we need to try our best to mitigate them. And if we can't mitigate them on the spot, step back, reevaluate the situation, and look at it with common sense and all the other tools that we have available to us before we make our decisions. Good job. Now let's take a look at uh, some recent fire situations. One uh, involving a guy named Scott Sugg off of the Boise National Forest. I believe this has to do with the Hilltop Fire. And uh, Brad, you were on this fire as I recall. But let's go ahead and take a look at the tape right now and see what kind of situation Scott found himself in. The Hilltop Fire was located just off of Highway 21, about 10 miles from Boise, Idaho. The fuel type was grass and brush. The fire started early afternoon, and our crew arrived approximately about 15.30 on September 24th. We worked with another helitack crew on the west flank of the fire. As it got later in the evening, the fire behavior calmed down, and the crews began to mop up approximately about 100 feet in. At about 20.00 or dusk, we had a shift change due to some duty limitations, so our crew was headed back into Boise to return first thing in the morning, while some engines and the incident commander would patrol and monitor the fire throughout the night. On our way back to Boise, we could hear radio traffic about a spot fire caused by winds changing down canyon at about 20 to 25 miles an hour, so we radioed the incident commander and asked if we should return. He said yes, so we headed back up Highway 21 to Hidden Valley Road and tied in with him with our Type 6 engine. Our crew was going to be responsible for the north side of the spot fire while the engines would work off a of Hidden Valley Road. We also tied in with two engine crew members, which brought our total to six firefighters. At this time, we had a, a briefing about some safety concerns, such as spotting, wind shifts, and LCES. The spot fire crossed Hidden Valley Road and was headed south-southeast towards some structures. We anchored into the cold black and off our Type 6 engine, which was working back towards the road. Okay. Our crew proceeded west on the north flank of the spot fire across the ridge tops with the prevailing winds at our back at about 20 miles per hour, which allowed us to use the direct attack method. We continued west. Eventually, we would like to tie back into the Hidden Valley Road. As we were attempting to make the corner to head south towards the road, we came across drainages which the fire behavior and terrain would not allow us to use the direct attack which we have been utilizing. This direct attack was not effective because we attempted to use it many times and had, had to pull back into our safety zone. So at this time, the crew had a discussion about building fire line downhill with fire below, what strategy and tactics to utilize, and potential hazards. Some individuals wanted to keep attempting to use the direct attack, which at this time was not a real option. So we pulled back to our safety zone and uh, watched to see what the fire would do. The fire was more active because of the topography and was making runs up the little drainages. As we made our way, uh, it, as the fire made its way up the drainage, it was burning towards lighter fields and near the ridge top where the wind would influence the fire behavior again. This would allow us to go more direct or use an indirect method and, and drag fire with us to black line our line. As we headed south towards Hidden Valley Road, we, we kept encountering drainage after drainage, which presented the same problem again and again. So every time we came up to a new drainage, we'd have to stop, evaluate, and look for tactics which could be more effective. And as we came up near Hidden Valley Road to the last drainage, the, we heard on the radio that a Type 6 engine was working its way towards us and we could see that they were running a hose lay down the opposite side of the drainage and that's where we would anchor in together. Scott made that scenario look pretty darn simple, but in fact it was rather a tricky situation. He did a good job of keeping that situation from becoming a disaster. It's funny, but the best decisions uh, on the fire line always seem to be the ones that nobody ever hears about. They never make the news. But let's ask our panel what their thoughts were on this. Brad, you were on that fire. 
Well, you know, what impressed me the most was the fact that next morning when I was getting the debrief from Scott doing the recon flight, I noticed several potentially uh, hazardous situations that they were faced with throughout the night while they were constructing their fire line. And as Scott uh, told me what their actions were to mitigate these hazards, you know, it came clear to me that they were really using a thought process. They weren't just going direct or, or, or attacking this fire without making sound judgments. And, you know, that's why I uh, brought this uh, scenario to this group so we could discuss it because it was one of those instances where, you know, they did everything right and we averted a potentially uh, tragic situation. Good. Any other comments? Hector? Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd like to, um, you know, confirm what you said about uh, good decisions not making 6 o'clock news. Uh, hats off to these guys uh, on this fire. It was one of these fires we'd never heard much about. Uh, good sound uh, judgment calls. Um, however, um, on the contrary, should things have gone bad, uh, someone would have been uh, injured or fatalities occurred. Remember, an investigation team would have been there and I guarantee you they would have been looking into the 10 and 18. They do use those uh, to, I mean, you'll find those in every investigative report you read. That's the first thing they judge your fire tactics on. They'll pull those out and, and look at them. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Anybody else? You know, uh, Ted, getting back again to basically back to what John Krebs had said, um, you know, look at what Scott Sugg did here. He was updating his tactics continually. What worked for him in one drainage may not have worked again, so he was continually updating those. He was basing everything off of the 10 standard orders and the 18 situations, although I really doubt he was pulling out his, uh, you know, his handy-dandy little card there and checking them out. He was probably doing it all intuitively. He made good sound decisions, and, you know, we wouldn't have heard about this unless Brad brought it to us. Yeah. And, I, and I think more of these situations happen than we realize. You know, most of our fires are done right. The ones that uh, we have a problem with or something goes wrong, those are the ones that end up making the news. But, yeah, Scott did a good job, I thought, of evaluating as he went. He didn't just make a plan and try to stick with it. Uh, that was one of those situations where you dig 50 feet of fire line and you're reevaluating and thinking about the whole situation again and then doing it again every 50 feet. And every ridge line he came over, he was faced with a different set of circumstances. So he was monitoring those conditions, as John Krebs puts it. You know, he took his time. He took his time. And it's exactly like we were saying in uh, Fire Order Number 6. He took his time. He made good, sound decisions. And there's a reason why he did that, Ted. Why training. Background and training. Uh, you know who he trained under? Uh, who? Lamar. <laughs> Myself. <laughs> but he did a great job, and I'm not surprised that he did what he did. Well, if he trained under you, then i got to give him even a double hats off if, if he manages to succumb that. So <laughs> he's doing pretty good. Uh, anyways, thanks to our panel for, for those comments. Those were good. So to conclude this section, let's remember that the 10 standard orders and the 18 watch-out situations are used as benchmarks for accident investigations, as Hector was mentioning, as well as being very useful tools in fire line operations. The standard orders and the watch-out situations were created to help you make sound, safe decisions on the fire line. But they only help you if you know them, understand them, and use them in day-to-day -day fire line operations and decision making. This is a big subject, and no matter how long you, you've been working in the fire program, you never really know it all. One thing I do know from my own experience, though, is that without a break once in a while, our ability to absorb information kind of gives way to a, you know, that need for a cold pop or a bathroom visit. So let's take a 15-minute break right now before we dive into the principles of LCES. <laughs> 